Hi, I'm Matt Lombard. Today I'd like to make a video of a recent presentation of Solid Edge Subdivision Modeling for Real World Parts that I gave at Realize Live 2022 recently in Las Vegas. I'm not a subdivision modeling expert by any means, so why am I making this video? I'm probably best known as the author of the SolidWorks Bible, SolidWorks Surfacing Bible, some video training courses, online books, websites, blogs, online articles, and other stuff. I've done a bit of organic surface modeling with history-based CAD, and if you've done a lot of that kind of work, you know that it's not a great tool for the job. I've encouraged CAD developers to come up with some better tools for that kind of modeling work. And now Solid Edge has subdivision modeling built right into their CAD tools, right alongside the history-based tools and the synchronous tools. So let's have a look at how some of these things work. These shapes can all be made in traditional NURBS history-based modeling. But at what cost? The rubber ducky I was able to model in four hours in SolidWorks, and it took me 30 minutes to do an equivalent in subdivision modeling. The joystick took me about 12 hours using an ordered process, and about two hours in subdivision. The helmet took me about six hours in traditional history-based surfacing, and about three hours in sub-D modeling. So there's a significant time penalty that we're paying for creating all of these complex shapes in traditional history-based surfacing methods. So what is subdivision modeling if it's such a great tool? It's a geometry kernel created by Pixar. Yes, that Pixar that brings us all of our great animated movies. It's non-parametric. It's non-sketch-based. It's non-feature-based, and it's non-history-based. So it's everything that engineers have come to avoid, and it's nothing that we're familiar with. So why do we need subdivision modeling? I think the argument of, of how much time you spend making organic models is argument enough for a new method. But subdivision modeling is related to point-based geometry. And this point-based geometry surrounds us as engineers. We find it in FEA mesh. We find it in 3D scan data. Our STL models all have point-based data. Even information that we get from healthcare systems like MRI and CAT scan models are all point-based. CGI, computer graphics, art and entertainment, and everything that Siemens is calling convergent technology is all based on point-based data. We can get a tessellated display information of the scan from a large plant or from dental implants or from a real wide range of types of data that engineers really use every day. So we need to get comfortable with point-based data if only for 3D print and 3D scan. But since we're getting comfortable with it, let's introduce some additional functionality. Subdivision modeling, which we call sub-D for short, is really good at a couple of things. You can create complex organic shapes that retain all of their continuity, and you can do that very quickly. This duck shape was created in just a couple of minutes, where to create something like this in a history-based modeler would take a couple of hours. Subdivision modeling blends between shapes very easily, and it allows you to edit complex shapes directly, visually, without a lot of complex modeling process involved. You don't have to worry about the order of your features. You don't have to worry about how you drew your splines. You don't have to worry about relationships between features. You just tug and pull on the model, and the shape is the final product. Can subdivision modeling compete with feature-based services? Well, here's a little bit that I stole from Mark Biasati. Mark did a mouse in subdivision modeling, not Solid Edge, but another product, and he did one in SolidWorks. And you can't tell the difference, really, between the two. If you look very closely, there are some subtle differences, but they're difficult to pick up. And if they're hard to see, does it matter if they're really there at all? 
Well, subdivision modeling isn't really new. It's been a around for a long time, about 20 years. And it's mostly been used in CGI. People that are designing game characters or 3D computer art or things like this. So it, it's a process that's outside of the normal flow for typical product designers and engineers. If we're talking about can these two processes compete, I think they can. And I think they can work together. Here's a real life project where I could have saved literally weeks of time if I had worked in subdivision modeling instead of history based features. These were all produced with BREP models, NURBS models, history based SolidWorks tools. And often when you create shapes like this, the concept of design intent just goes out the window. You make an edit to one part of the model and the rest of it blows up. That kind of thing really doesn't happen with subdivision modeling. Let's take a little more detailed look at, at how SubD really works. Typically, in subdivision modeling, you start from a primitive shape. And that primitive could be a cylinder, a sphere, rectangle, or torus. And you can see that the gray geometry, which is NURBS geometry, is surrounded by a cage of blue lines and blue dots. It's these blue lines and dots that you can manipulate directly to create a shape. So you'll start out with something pristine and perfect like a sphere, and you'll twist it, poke it, and prod it until it looks like something else. You can grab groups of points, and pull on them at the same time. You can grab a single point. You can add more subdivisions as you stretch out your shape. You make a selection and then you make an edit. And you keep on editing until you've achieved the shape that you want. The result is really only limited by your imagination. Let's take another look even closer and see how this process is accomplished. I got started on this joystick controller shape by creating a cylinder. And then I pulled out one side of the cylinder to make an oblong egg. And then I stretched out the oblong egg and expanded the two ends and then bent the entire thing to create the joystick. Here I select a portion of the cage and use the scale function to enlarge that selection. You can see that the model gets more and more complex the further you go into it. And that's the main idea with subdivision modeling is that you make the overall shape first and then you add smaller details to it later on. There is no list of operations that you've performed. There are no features that you've created. It's just shape. And that shape is all driven by the position of this cage of points around the model. Next, I select the scaled up area and use the synchronous like steering wheel to twist that end of the model. It's just twisting the selection. Next, I bend the model slightly. And then I use split to subdivide the faces of the model further, enabling me to make some edits to the shape. This is like adding points to a spline. From here, I'm able to tweak the added subdivision areas to add more shape. And with each edit, the workflow is to simply select a set of points on the cage and then to use either a tool or the steering wheel to move the position of that cage, which edits the shape of the part. You can think of the subdivision cage as if it were the control frame on a spline. You're probably familiar with drawing splines and the fact that a spline can have this control frame that's not on the surface of the spline, but you can use the frame to control the spline as if the points on the frame were magnets and they were 
influencing the shape of the spline, which is a wire. This is only an analogy. It's not really the way it works. The subdivision modeling tools in Solid Edge are found on the surfacing tab, and it works in synchronous as well as it does in ordered. But you don't get the best results in synchronous, so I recommend that if you're using this in Solid Edge, that you should use the ordered mode. The shapes that you can start out with are your primitives, and then there are several operations that you can execute, such as you can apply symmetry to the model, so that creates a plane, and anything that you do on one side of the model is automatically mirrored to the other side. You can scale a portion of the model, or the entire model. These operations apply only to a special selection. So you would select points and then apply the operation to those points. So you can scale up just a small selection of the entire part. Some of these operations can be difficult for somebody who's always worked in history-based modeling to understand because they don't have any direct correlation to the way that you work with a history-based model. The blend operation edits a property on the model itself, which varies numerically, and you can make the numbers bigger or smaller to go from sharp, which would be zero blend, up to the maximum blend, which would be a very continuous and smooth blend between faces. You can create offsets from the face of the model by selecting faces and then assigning a value. BREP and SUBD can interact. So in this case, I've created a wheel using standard BREP, NURBS, history-based modeling, and the gray support for it was created as a SUBD model. And because the finished product of the SUBD model is also a NURBS body, you can merge these two together and create a single solid body so yes, sub-D models will be compatible with your parts and assemblies. The methods that you used in feature-based modeling can still be used to some extent in sub-D modeling. You can create sketch lines in 3D space to help guide your 3D model. You can also use a scan data to help you create a match between an existing model and something you're trying to create. Since we're trying to make something realistic here, we're going to have to use real tools that we use to make real parts in CAD, such as draft analysis. So depending on how you're going to split this part, you may want to pull left to right, up to down, you may want to have multiple pulls on this part, but we're going to try to be as simple as possible for this one. We can see that we've got a slight undercut underneath the beak, and a slight undercut there between the eyes if we're pulling the ducky apart left to right. And those show up in the draft analysis. You can also use curvature shading in Solid Edge to find spots where the curvature is very tight. And as you all know, curvature on real world parts can be directly related to failures of the shell feature or what's called thin wall feature in solid edge. So via color, you can identify these spots beforehand. The thin wall feature has a great function that it shows you where there's going to be problems. And we already knew we were going to have some difficulty with the beak and between the eyes. How do you deal with shelling out parts that won't shell is a completely different presentation Then that would take another chunk of time. There are a lot of ways to do it. You can model things manually. You're probably going to have to go in with some surface tools. You can cut the model up into pieces and shell out the parts that are successful automatically and then manually do the ones that fail on the automatic tools. Plastic parts can often be a game of, of rock, paper, scissors using fillets, draft, and thin wall to get the right combination or the right order of features that works for your particular model. After you've created the sub-D model, these features that we're adding, such as the thin wall feature, any ribs or bosses that we might need to create, these are all being added as ordered features. 
because this is the kind of thing that ordered modeling is good at. And trying to create engineering type features with subdivision modeling would be crazy. Here we have the subdivision duck with ordered features split in half. And we go back and edit the subdivision feature, grab the back end of the duck to make some edits, and drag those points forward to make the tail a little bit smaller. And then when we finish the edit, the ordered features update to the new geometry. So really the best of both worlds here, being able to make the main shape using tools that are good for making that shape, and then making the engineered features using tools that are good for making engineered features. These tools are all fairly new in Solid Edge, and they're not necessarily as mature as some of the other CGI tools like Modo or Blender or Maya or things like that. But then again, these tools are really aimed at product designers and not at guys making monsters and race cars and things like that. I would expect these tools to increase in sophistication, much as the synchronous tools increased in sophistication over the course of years. The important thing to know here is that you can use these tools in Solid Edge, but you don't have to. You have the option of working with your ordered data in the same way that you've always worked with ordered data. Or you could work with your synchronous data in the same way that you've always worked with synchronous data. Or now you can work with your subdivision modeling in a new workflow that you're going to develop working with this kind of data. And the best news is that you can take all three of those types of data and you can combine them. Your ordered models, your synchronous models, and your subdivision models where all the data actually works together. So where and when do you use subdivision modeling? It's great for making complex shapes really quickly. It's less great for accuracy. It's less great for crisp detail. These are all things that you'll probably want to use ordered features for. Subdivision modeling greatly simplifies most of the complex operations in surface design and especially the editing. It's a new skill that you've got to learn and you're only going to learn it by doing it. Try it out on a test project. Get training from someone who's a CGI expert to evaluate these tools. Consult with a specialist to help you develop skills and workflow, in particular how you apply this to real world product modeling. There's a time and a place for everything. Not every model is a great first project for sub-D modeling. It's a skill that you have to practice and learn. So thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video. And you can follow links to my blog at designstuff.com or to my new CAD forum at cadforum.net. Or you can send me a personal email. Thanks again, and good luck.